Good morning. Welcome to Purdue Engineering Distinguished Lecture Series. Um, I'm Wayne Chen, Associate Dean for Research and Innovation in the College of Engineering. This series is established in 2018. Since then, we have been inviting world-renowned faculty and professionals to Purdue Engineering to encourage thought-provoking discussions and ideas with our faculty and the students regarding the grand challenges and opportunities in their fields. So uh, we've been doing this once every few months, and it's a distinguished series, and traditionally, uh, a dean is going to introduce our distinguished speaker. So it is my pleasure to introduce our new dean, uh, Dr. Arvind Raman, who is the new John Edwardson Dean of uh, Purdue University College of Engineering. He's also the Robert Adams Professor of uh, Mechanical Engineering. Dean Raman. Thank you. Hi. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, everyone who is in this great, great atrium and all those online, this uh, lecture is going to be uh, broadcast live, so uh, welcome to all of you. Um, it's, it's really a, an honor and a privilege to introduce our speaker today. He is one of the true giants in computer vision. Uh, professor Jitendra Malik uh, is the Arthur J. Chick Professor at ECS and UC Berkeley. He also has a part-time appointment at Meta. Uh, his research has spanned many areas, computer vision, AI, machine learning, robotics, human visual perception, and many more. Uh, but he and his research group have been known for tremendous impact in the community, right? They have been known for an isotropic, the perona mullick diffusion algorithms, not often that you get algorithms named after uh, yourself, um, normalized cuts, Im image segmentation, shape context and object detection algorithms, high dynamic range imaging, and many more, right? These have had a tremendous impact in, in the field. He's been recognized uh, for the impact in many different ways. Uh, he was a 2013 IEEE Distinguished Research Researcher in Computer Vision. In 2014, and this is something we at Purdue uh, are very proud of, uh, that he was the winner of the King Sung Fu Prize from IAPR, the, the, the Institute for uh, pa the International uh, Association for Pattern Recognition. I don't know if many of you know the history, uh, but Professor King Sung Fu was a, was a Goss Distinguished Professor here in Electrical Computer Engineering, and he established IAPR. So that's a great connection, and uh, Professor Malik, if you have a chance, we'd love to show you the mural uh, in the Fu conference room uh, dedicated to uh, Professor King Sung Fu, so you're welcome to that as well. In 2016, he won the ACM AI Alan Newell Award, and in 2018, the IJC AI Award for Artificial Intelligence. In 2019, this was followed by the IEEE Computer Society's Pioneer Award. Uh, Dr. Malik is a uh, member of the National Academy of Engineering, as well as the National Academy of Science, and he is, of course, a AAAS Arts and Sciences Academy member as well. Please join me in welcoming Professor Malik. Thank you. Thank you very much for this uh, generous introduction. Uh, it's my pleasure to be here. And uh, uh, Professor Kingson Fu's name was mentioned. He is uh, one of the pioneers of our field. Uh, uh, so there were, uh, the field of pattern recognition, there was a, for a long time this sort of tussle between pattern recognition and symbolic uh, ap approaches to AI. And of course, the final answer is going to be a bit of both, but. Uh, what we are currently seeing is actually the victory of the pattern recognition school uh, of, uh, of AI. Uh, I mean, a lot of the machine learning techniques and neural network techniques, in some say, sense, go back to the, to the pattern recognition tradition, which Professor Fu pioneered. So it's a great pleasure for me to be here and at Purdue uh, and speaking in, in this, at this event. So I'm going to talk today about uh, robots that learn and adapt, and uh, uh, it's a high-level talk for a general audience. Uh, so I want to start by 
talking about uh, what is natural intelligence before we talk about artificial intelligence. And the way we can think about natural intelligence is through evolution, the lens of evolution. So something like 550 million years ago is when you had the first multicellular animals that could uh, move. And moving gave them an advantage because they could find food in different places. But if you could go to food in different places, you need to know where to go. And for that, you need perception, something like a vision system. So the earliest animals which had perception, they had a combination of this ability to move and this ability to see. And there's a psychologist, Gibson, who has this statement. We see in order to move, and we move in order to see. So this is the most central aspect of intelligence, I would argue, this combination of movement and perception. Moving down the evolutionary tree, you have uh, hominids, uh, the early, early human humans, when they, we branch off from uh, other primates. And then you have the development of bipedalism. So you walk on two legs, so now your hands are free for tool use and so on. And uh, the development of tools uh, uh, gave us the ability to modify our environment in a more significant way. And uh, the brain developed in response to exploit that. So there is this quote from a Greek philosopher. It is because of his being armed with hands that man is the most intelligent animal. The development of the hand preceded the development of increased brain capacity. And then, of course, we can go on to modern humans, uh, you know, coming out of Africa maybe about 60,000 years ago. And uh, somewhere earlier than that, maybe a million years ago, maybe half a million, we don't, who knows, uh, we have the development of language and so on. So these things that, like language and symbolic behavior, is relatively recent in the evolutionary history of, uh, of us, right? From this 500 million years, if you think of one million years, if you think of the whole uh, history of, uh, of intelligence as 24 hours, then this is the last two, three minutes, OK? Now, of course, that is what we care about a lot today, because everybody is talking about chat GPT. And I think we will have this discussion at greater length in the afternoon in a panel. But it's incredible. I mean, I, I think the, what this can do, it has captured the popular imagination. And uh, you know, it do well at LSATs and, uh, and all these uh, various kinds of tests, which the general person in the street thinks of as associated with intelligence. On the other hand, I want to talk about what we can't do or we have not been able to do. Uh, Self-driving cars, it's a similar thing, a similar capability, which is in the popular imagination. And the first self-driving cars were in the 1980s. Uh, this uh, person whose photo is there is uh, Dick Manns. Dick Manns had demonstrated cars driving on the autobahns in Germany in the 1980s and uh, solving the control problem of staying in the lane and so on. And we still don't have self-driving cars. I mean, uh, Elon Musk told us in 20, uh, what was it, in 2018, he promised that next, in the, by the middle of next year, we'll have uh, a million Teslas, uh, all self-driven. Not quite there, right? OK. Uh, and then uh, I, I will make it even more mundane. And, and, and driving, a 16-year-old kid in 20 hours of driving experience can do this. Whereas you're talking about becoming a lawyer, which uh, supposedly takes years of training. And we can solve one problem, but we can't solve the other problem. And I'll pick uh, something even more mundane, what a 12-year-old can do, right? In a kitchen with, uh, with some implements, we can do all these things. So this is a collection of verbs of, you know, if you want to make an omelet, you need to be able to stir, you need to be able to chop, you need to be able to slice, things like this. And we can. Uh, a kid of 12 can do this. No robot today can do this. OK. So this is what is known as a Moravec paradox in our business. And uh, Hans Moravec said this in 1988. But I think it was actually folk wisdom. Lots of people knew it. He articulated it. And so he deserves credit for this, which is that it is comparatively easy to make computers exhibit adult level performance on intelligence tests or playing checkers and difficult or impossible to give them the skills of one-year-olds when it comes to perception and mobility. And Steve Pinker has a nice slogan, which is, 
The main lesson of 35 years of AI research is that the hard problems are easy and that the easy problems are hard. And then uh, it goes on to say that the gardeners, receptionists, and cooks are secure in their jobs for years to come. Okay, so the question is why? I think this is an interesting question, and I think, again, I think we'll get to this in the panel uh, this afternoon, so I don't want to, uh, you know, uh, so this, think of this as anticipation that we will discuss it more, which is that, why is this so? And one argument can be, I think Morabek's original argument was that uh, it's more difficult to reverse engineer skills which are older in the evolutionary uh, process and have taken much more time to optimize and perfect. And I think another argument could be in terms of data, but I don't want to go into it because this is the afternoon uh, panel. But uh, so my focus is uh, I really want to build the two-year-old or uh, potentially the home robot. I think it would be wonderful if all of us could have a robot in the home which could assist with various chores. Or more seriously, I mean, a very large fraction of the population is elderly, and we need them taken care of. And a robot in the home could take care of help uh, out in many ways. So this is really a societal need, I would argue. And it's what I, I, I feel that I want to work on. My, the next 10 years, if we can have a home robot, I'll be happy. Just like we had home computers, which in the 1980s took off, right? Before that, it, a computer was a big, expensive thing. It took off because there were applications like spreadsheets and video games and word processing which made uh, using a computer worthwhile and it became cheap enough and useful enough. Well, when will that happen for robots? So that's the application. And now let's see, uh, let's get into it. Okay, so I'm gonna start with some examples. Uh, so this is a robot that we have and uh, it's walking in this terrain, okay? And it's, uh, it's uh, walking autonomously. I'm not controlling it with something. And, uh, the, uh, and uh, here is, so this robot is a fairly cheap robot. You can, there is a, it's manufactured by a Chinese company called Unitry, and uh, they can sell it to you for $10,000 or less. I think the version's for much less now. So uh, it's in the range. This is the kind of price point when it's a few thousand dollars, you can imagine a machine like that in every home. Okay, and, but robots have to walk in these different situations. Very importantly, this robot is blind. It has no vision right now. I'm going to add vision later, but right now it's blind. But it has to walk in all these different kinds of terrains, right? Which it doesn't know in advance. And importantly, it's going to use the same controller. I, I'm not allowed to say, oh, swap in controller A, controller B, controller C, controller F7.3. No. It's the same controller which has to work in all these conditions. Okay, more examples. Or... Okay. So I think that is the problem of robotics. We need to be able to work in a wide variety of conditions. In the walking case, this is about walking in different terrain. Okay, it has to work. If you are talking about manipulating an object, if I have to slice uh, a, 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 a tomato, I should be able to slice different kinds of tomatoes with different kinds of knives. So uh, I want to connect this with uh, uh, the field of pattern recognition versus control theory uh, as the big grand ideas. Pattern recognition, as I said, is a field pioneered by Professor Fu. And in pattern recognition, what we regard as the central issue is generalization. So what is a cat? What is a chair? What is a dog? Visually, right? We realize that mathematically, we cannot come up with necessary and sufficient conditions for defining a chair or the appearance of a chair. We do it by examples, and then we train some uh, machine learning system, some classifier to do this. So generalization over aspects like pose, lighting, and so on are critical. If you think about it in the context of action, in the context of control, what do we need? We need robustness. This is a standard concern of control theory. The standard concern of control theory is that you're trying to do something, 
like maybe maintain the temperature uh, of the house at whatever, 75 degrees Fahrenheit, and there'll be some perturbation. Some, maybe some window is open and cold air comes in. Well, what you do is you do something to compensate for the disturbance. So that's the central aspect of control theory. But I would argue uh, that there's an equally important aspect, which is adaptation. Okay, so adaptation to different terrains, and I'm going to go into that in, a, in, in more detail. So uh, I will not have too many equations in this slide, but this one equation I have to have because it defines the problem of control theory, which is uh, control developed around 1960. This is very important. Uh, I think we give a lot of credit to aerospace uh, uh, people, and they should get credit. I mean, after all, we are in the Armstrong building, so. How can I not give credit to aerospace people? But also you should give credit to the control theorists because if there wasn't control theory, we would not be able to have accurate orbits and uh, you know, not be able to, uh, I mean, John F. Kennedy could say, we will send man to the moon and bring him back safely, but the safely part depends on having accurate orbits and that's control theory, right? And 1960 is like a very, a crucial date here because the period just before and after, you had all these br brilliant pieces of work. I mean, the US with uh, people like Bellman and uh, Soviet Union with people like Pontryagin, uh, Kalman in the US, uh, and then uh, the less appreciated in the control theory world, but as a pregenitor of a lot of machine learning, Arthur Samuel's work on reinforcement learning, this is also around 1960. And these are all related because reinforcement learning is just a trial and error way of solving the uh, control problem, which is an optimal control problem. So in this equation, x dot equals ax plus bu, what we have is uh, x is the state, okay? So that in the, from a physics setting, it would correspond to say positions and velocities of particles or in, the case of my robot, it might be positions and joint, angle, joint angles and their velocities. U is the controller, so I can apply some extra input. And A and B here are matrices in this linear formulation, but you can imagine a non-linear version of this setup. Okay. Uh, okay, so this is a very, I'm, I'm using very classic terminology here, circa 1960. Uh, look at that matrix A. So that matrix A is what captures the system dynamics, how the system changes from one time instant to the next, right? And this is uh, Newtonian mechanics, for example. Uh, and, but I want to use this matrix A to capture the effects of different kinds of terrain and so on. So what that tells me is that this matrix A is actually not a constant. And it can change very, very significantly. Now, that is the problem that I'm going to focus on. And that's what I'm calling, going to call adaptive control. It's related to the classical idea of adaptive control that electrical engineers have studied. And they studied it going back to the 1960s. But I'm going to do it using the tools of deep learning, machine learning, uh, neural networks, and so on. So basically, if you want to understand philosophically where all of what my work is going to be, uh, a classic problem approached with tools of neural networks, and I'm bringing these two together. Okay, so that's the setup. And it's essentially that this matrix A is not a constant, but it varies, and I have to try to uh, do the right thing for different kinds of uh, choices of system dynamics. Okay, so that sets up uh, the, the, that's the problem formulation. And I'm going to talk about uh, this walking robot as a running example, but the techniques that we have developed apply in other cases, and I'll show you a few other examples. So we call this uh, rapid motor adaptation. So, but think of it mentally as, okay, that matrix A is changing around and I have to adapt to it. And that's, that's what we are going to do for legged robots. Okay. So how do we do this? So we train, uh, we, 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 so the problem of, uh, it, it, we, we start out by solving the problem in simulation. And again, this is some, 
uh, simulation technology has just got better and better over time. So, uh, so of course, control theorists have always tried to model the system and write down the equations. But after that, the equations can get kind of tricky. And in particular, when you talk about legged locomotion, contact is made and broken. And therefore, the differential equations that you must use when you have contact with one leg versus the air, I mean, these change a lot. And then you get into hybrid system. I mean, the whole thing is it, it requires a lot of mental gymnastics to make that work. On the other hand, the physics is actually not straightforward. So, Putting it into a simulator is actually quite easy. And, we can, and, and, and the simulators work faster just because of computers are getting faster. right? So simulators work. So what we are going to do is to train this robot to walk in simulation and using the machinery of reinforcement learning, which, if you don't know, it's a very simple mental model. It's trial and error. The robot is going to try to walk. I'm going to give some commands to all its joints and so on. And then I'll see what happens. If it walks, good, plus one. If it falls, bad, minus one. And over time, it tries to have that kind of behavior which gets it more plus ones rather than more minus ones. And you can put this in a mathematical way. But, but that's it. I mean, uh, there are some details, but uh, there are no pre-programmed gates. We don't start out by saying that the the... It's, it's a walk or a gallop or a trot or whatever. I mean, in, traditionally in a walking controllers, you, you in, in input that. Turns, it turns out that this is not necessary. All you need to do is to have some kind of cost function. What is desired? What is desired is that you walk in a way without falling and you use minimum energy. Very simple. And now you just do trial and error. And, and uh, it's... it's OK, and then you will try to find some controller which is optimal in some sense. So that's it. So that's the basic idea. So in simulation, we have these parameters like mass, uh, you know, friction, terrain, height. And you can vary all of these. So we actually have some kind of a fractal terrain generator. And the robot has to walk in fractal terrain. So fractal terrain prepares it for small steps, large steps, lots of variation. And then you vary things like friction. You vary. So you can, in a simulator, you can create lots and lots of conditions. And we know all those variables because it's a simulator. I have access to all of that. And, uh, and the robot has to walk. And this, this, this box, this base policy, this, this, this red guy, this is the controller. The job of the controller is to issue commands. So the commands here are indicated by A. And the commands here are what are desired values for the joint angles and velocities. And you give those commands to a low-level PD controller, which is actually managing the motor currents and so on. OK. And uh, so what is the, uh, any controller needs to uh, get some input. So the input here is x of t, which is the state, which is all the joint angles and so on. Uh, A, which is the actions, which in control theory you would use the symbol U. So reinforcement learning and control theory do the same thing, but they use different symbols. Okay, one uses X, one uses S, one uses U, one uses A. And I've tried to keep both sides happy by using X, which control theorists like, and A, which reinforcement learning people like. Okay, so A is the action at the previous stage. Okay. But here is one uh, idea which is that we know that the same policy is not going to work in all conditions. When I'm walking on hard ground versus walking on a down slope versus walking in sand, I need to, do, I need to issue slightly different commands to all my motors. So how do I capture that? You make your policy have an extra argument, Z. And this Z captures uh, some aspect of the terrain. OK. And z is going to be a fairly low dimensional uh, thing, maybe five, maybe eight dimensions, and so on. So uh, these five or eight dimensions, I think we concretely we used eight dimensions. These eight dimensions capture the, the variability in the terrain. And so what the policy gets are two arguments, the usual things for any controller, the state and the previous action, and this 
this variable z. Okay. So if you go back to my previous equation, x dot equals ax plus bu, where that a is the system dynamics, well, that a changes depending on z. And now you're supplying that z. And z in this case is known, right? Why is it known? Because uh, it's a simulator. I choose all those conditions. I choose the mass. I choose the, uh, the, the terrain height, et cetera, et cetera. So what we have is, but we, we, we can have lots of va va variables, but actually those variables all don't matter. And you can do something equivalent to a PCA, a principal component analysis to reduce the dimensionality. And that is captured by this red box called the environmental factor encoder which compresses it down to some uh, eight, uh, eight numbers. And uh, in this case, it's not PCA, but it's the nonlinear version of that, which is you have some neural network encoder with a few layers, but it's compressing it down. And we don't have to specify exactly what eight dimensions should be. This training process is end to end, and it will figure out a way to compress uh, the relevant physical variables down. Okay. So we call this extrinsics. Okay, and, and what, is the, uh, what is the robot trying to do? It's trying to walk, and there's a reward function, or if you want, uh, you can call it cost function. So again, there's a reinforcement learning and control theorists do the opposite. Reinforcement learning people maximize reward, control theory people try to minimize the cost, but it's just a minus sign, right? So the reward function it tries to minimize uh, the energy consumption. Okay. Good. So we do this, and then our robot can walk. And this is the result of the robot walking in a simulator. And now we are going to take this and make it work in the real world. OK. And uh, so it seems straightforward, right? OK. And I'm going to take it, make it work. But the problem is that I can't, I don't no longer have this Z. Because the Z in a simulator was known because I knew the mass, I knew the terrain height, et cetera. And this environmental factor encoder just took this privileged information and uh, compressed it. But at, uh, in the real world, I don't know it. So what am I going to do? So, uh, so basically, that's what I have to figure out some way of estimating. So, it'll, so that's my problem. And, and what's the solution? So the solution, it come, turns out to be, let me give you the intuition, and then we'll do the mathematical aspect a little bit later. The intuition is, uh, so imagine this is, a, this is a blind robot, by the way. So if I'm walking on this surface, which is very hard, versus when I'm walking on a beach. When I walk on a beach, what happens, and I apply the, exactly the same commands. So on a beach, when I put my foot down, it doesn't lift up as much because it sinks in and it doesn't lift up. So even if I am blind, just by my applying exactly the same commands to my, my, uh, my legs and feet, I get different behavior, which reveals to me that I am in different conditions. So, so, that's the, uh, so that's the insight. So the insight here is that the sequence of past uh, past states and actions, if I look at my last one second of history and I commanded certain actions and I achieved certain states, that is kind of a diagnostic for what kind of terrain I'm walking in. Okay? So this is what we call this red, uh, this thing called the adaptation module. So I'm saying this adaptation module, it's it, if we give it the input of the past history, it may be able to take that history and figure out what's the Z, what are the, what are the latent variables corresponding to the terrain. And uh, so that's the idea. Now I've, I've just postulated this magic module which will estimate the Z. And uh, okay, how do I estimate this? So that's the problem. So then let me reveal how that can be solved. So the way this, so, the, so we, are, we do a phase one and phase two. Phase one is training and simulation. Phase two, 
what we do is also in simulation. And now what we do is to say that I am going to train this adaptation module. But in simulation, I actually know what the Z is. So in simulation, I had access to the ground truth values of the, uh, of, of the terrain. And from that, I had an estimator for Z. And now I tell my adaptation module, you have access to the past history, and you predict the same Z. So this is a regression problem. You have, uh, it's a most straightforward supervised learning problem. So this adaptation module is trying to mimic what you would produce uh, if you had access to uh, the ground truth variables. And uh, OK, so that's how we can train the adaptation module. So you see yet another neural network which is trained. And, uh, and, now, uh, and now we have a system which can work autonomously. Because with this, we have trained this adaptation module, and it's going to use the past history to work. And, uh, and now we have this uh, our slogan is, one policy to walk them all. So it's exactly the same controller. It varies in different, uh, OK, so it can walk in all these conditions. I'll give you an example to explain this adaptation module idea. OK, so here is, uh, so these experiments were done, by the way, during COVID times. So my student, I told him, OK, take the robot home. And so he's doing these experiments at his home. And he's got this mattress. And he's going to, this is, his name is Ashish. He's going to pour some olive oil. OK, and there's a plastic sheet. And then he has got this robot, and he's put some plastic socks on the robot. And now the robot is going to try to walk. And notice what happens. It is about to slip, and then it recovers. And you can see it in slow-mo. And then it recovers. So what should happen in theory? What should happen in theory is that it's always recording this history of observations. And what we wanted to do is that in very quickly, in like half a second, to estimate the new z. And this is basically what you will see in these plots. So the top four rows, they show uh, the footfall pattern. So which feet is on the ground. So, so it's uh, right rear, front left, things like that. The four, there are four legs. And then uh, the, the, the two curves at the bottom, there's a red curve and a blue curve. And they are two of the eight dimensions of this variable, of this uh, latent variable z. And what you see is that as it will walk and it will stumble, the estimate of those Z, Z1 and Z5 change. So, so it stumbles, but now it's got a correct Z after recovered. And then uh, its policy adapts to that. OK. And, and, and so this is where, so the secret is you adapt, but you adapt quickly, like in half a second. And, and so that saves you from falling. If it took you five seconds to adapt, you will have fallen. It, you can't do it in 0.01 seconds because you don't have data. But that's, that's it. It's like we all recover from stumbles. OK, and these are more examples. So this is a payload throw. OK, and, uh, and it slow-mo. OK, I'll, I'll speed it. And, and then the same behavior that uh, it estimates. So this, uh, this al our algorithm is called RMA, Rapid Motor Adaptation. And it uh, enables this estimation and then this change. Again, default adaptation, recovered gate. OK, more examples. And if you didn't have adaptation, OK. OK. So I, I, I think I've now covered the main technical uh, insight in the work. And now I'll just show you lots and lots of ways in which this makes various problems easy to solve. So there's one uh, problem, which is uh, that uh, we, we want to walk at different speeds. OK, and this is what we did. We did not have to pre-program anything. We said to the robot, walk at 0.375 meters per second. 
and then this is what it did okay this is the gate that emerged and and then we said so what you see at the bottom are the four uh, feet and then we said walk at a speed of uh, 0.9 meters per second but notice the, that these are quite different gates but we did not program them we just said to the robot it uh, go at a certain speed okay and it turns out that there is an explanation for this which uh, people in biomechanics had done the hypothesis is that an animal always tries to move at efficient uh, to minimize energy because uh, if you're a tiger or a deer it's for both of you it's important that you use your energy more efficiently and at slow speeds for humans it is also true for humans at slow speeds walking is efficient at high speeds running is efficient for horses you have these gallop trot canter etc and they people have done these curves which show when they are efficient and we get exactly the same behavior with a robot and the beauty is that this just emerges you didn't have to do anything and uh, you just said okay and now using rma this these uh, can be just it works in different settings okay so so this this gives you a flavor. so this is a blind robot and we showed that it could go at any speed different gates emerge all that was nice and then i have spent most of my career in in vision and then i'm here i am working on blind robots so so there's some disconnect here so the question is do we need vision okay do we need vision to walk clearly blind people can walk so therefore we have to start there but there are settings where vision is helpful right if you have to go across a river and stepping stones then you probably want uh, you probably want uh, setting right so so there, this is a setting where we we developed uh, uh, we the role of vision again i'm going to go fast here but a traditional approach would be that you build up a terrain by combining data from multiple images and that turns out to be very noisy and a much better strategy is that uh, you 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 go directly from vision to control you don't have to first build a map of the terrain okay so there are, for robotics people there is this approach called slam by which you take multiple views and you build a map and i'm saying it's not necessary you want to go from vision to control and uh, and the philosophy which i showed earlier works that in a simulator you can have privileged information you know the terrain you so the robot is knows in fact in advance what the terrain coming up will be because it's in a simulator and so you start with that okay so you you strain it uh, to work with that kind of knowledge that it will never have in the real world but then what you do is that with a camera uh, with an imagine that you have some kind of camera on the head of the robot which sees this rgbd depth this egocentric depth and then you try to use that to approximate what this privileged information would be and again we capture it in a small num number of dimensions so we had previously this variable z now you have a variable gamma and uh, so it's the same philosophy but now for estimating the terrain you're reducing it to a small number of variables and let's see how it works and now you can deploy it in the real world and i'll show you some demos here it does not know the terrain there is no nothing everything is on board on board sensing on board compute Yeah, 
going to the next one. Okay, so uh, then we have done some experiments on uh, bipedal robots, because, uh, uh, but uh, okay. Uh, okay, wait. So there's something here where my display has got. Can you? Uh, Thank you. Okay, I think I've. Uh, uh, okay, so you 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 got the flavor, but I'll show you some other examples of the same idea. So this is. Uh, okay, so here we have a robot doing a manipulation task, and these are different kinds of objects of different size and different shape. And uh, basically, the same idea works. Because normally, people design controllers, but they'll design it for a specific object in a specific shape. Here, what is happening is, uh, is uh, exactly, uh, OK, so this shows the, uh, what, what's the various conditions. So we have very light objects, like a shuttlecock, and very heavy objects. And uh, it all works because uh, of the same philosophy. So we first train in simulation, where we allow for a lot of variation. And then we have this variable z, which captures some parameters of the condition, which may be, in this case, they correspond to different size and shape of the object. And, uh, and then we can deploy it in the real world. I want to uh, uh, conclude with some general remarks about uh, how we should think about learning broadly. And uh, I like to think of it with, uh, with uh, children's development as an example. So children, uh, and this is an idea actually which goes back to Turing. Turing in his paper, the famous 1950 paper, said that uh, we should, instead of trying to build an adult brain, we should try to build a child's brain and then subject it to a program of education or learning. And children have this very rich process of learning. They're constantly experimenting with the world. They're multimodal. They're looking at, they take an object, put it in the mouth. They have the touch signal. They have the vision signal. They have auditory signal. They proceed in stages. And uh, psychologists, uh, uh, psychologists have characterized this. Uh, this is uh, actually Professor Linda Smith, who's at Indiana University. Be multimodal, incremental, physical, explore, and then finally use language. And I believe that these ideas are equally relevant for us in computer vision and robotics. And I'll conclude with this last example, which is a learning visual locomotion with cross-modal supervision. So we decided, can we train a robot to learn to walk in the real world? And it has only an RGB camera. It does not have RGBD. OK. And what we did was we said, it's going to start out blind. So this is how a blind robot walks. OK. And uh, do you see what behavior it discovered? It's very similar to a blind person using a stick to poke at obstacles. OK. OK, so now uh, the problem that I pose to you is, how do you make use of vision? Okay, so now I put a camera. So it's got a camera. And, and with a camera, obviously, it works better. But I want to train in the real world how to use the camera. And it turns out there's a simple idea which you can use. Imagine, think of this robot on the steps. So you can, the robot can, at this point, calculate the depth of every leg, because it knows all its joint angles and so on. So using proprioception, its own joint angles and so on, it knows the height of uh, 
of the ground underneath each of its four feet. That's easy for it to calculate with its internal knowledge. So what we do is, with vision, so proprioception tells me all the depth when I get there. And vision is giving me images. So what I do is, I tell my vision system, predict 1.5 seconds in advance what will be the depth when I get there. Okay? And so it's a self-supervised training system. I have both the training signals. I'm going to train my vision system with what I will, what my proprioception will sense 1.5 seconds later. And that's it. And that gives you a totally self-supervised system. And uh, the beauty is that with this we got, we were able to train a system which learned from day to day. And every day its performance went up. And you can now do funny things like you can mess with a camera in real time. You took, we took this camera and what uh, Antonio is going to do is to modify, he's going to rotate the camera. This is, if you do this in a robotics lab, your colleagues will hate you because you have messed up the result of calibration for, okay? And what will happen is that initially the robot will stumble, okay? But it's collecting data. It's collecting visual data and it's collecting proprioception data. And uh, in, uh, in due course of time, it will uh, just start to. Uh, so let's, uh, let me show you this. This is what happens before adaptation. And this is what happens after one minute of training. So, uh, so I believe that this is the future, that we should learn, we should have robots which are constantly adapting, and we, can, we have a lot to learn from the strategies used in biology. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Malik, for a very thought-provoking and fascinating lecture. Now we're open to questions. From audience. Hi, uh, Professor. Oh. Louder, please. Hi, uh, yes. Professor. Uh, thank you for the talk. I actually have two questions. So typically, when we do neural networks, we have to train it using backpropagation, right? Now, uh, with our reinforced learning model, we don't have such an expression to tell, oh, if I change this particular weight, I know exactly how the cost function changes. So how do we actually train it? Is it just pure trial error by, are we just yeah, doing so, something? So you, ha you have other kinds of algorithms. So it is harder than with supervised learning. So here you have to use algorithms which are called policy gradient. And what they're trying to do is that There'll be some trials which are successful trials and some trials which are not so successful, where success means more reward versus less reward. And you try to uh, make the, the, the network which predicts an action give more of the actions which lead to good rewards. And that, this is called a policy gradient. So the gradient is on the policy. And uh, there are optimization algorithms called uh, PPO and TRPO which enable you to solve that problem. The, the net, the, the, uh, it does take longer. I see, so the way we compute the gradients is to evaluate it in the real world. Yes. Okay, uh, thank you. Yeah. Uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Malik. Uh, thank you for the fantastic talk. So I have a question about uh, providing guarantees for stability or um, robustness in the theoretical sense. So I think the, general, the generalization capabilities of learning-based approaches are beyond what model-based approaches can achieve for locomotion control. But do you think providing theoretical guarantees about stability is important? If it is important, then what are your thoughts about approaching that problem? Yeah, so, so the question is about uh, theoretical guarantees. It's a fair question. And uh, I think this is uh, actually an important, uh, I think of it as a philosophical question which engineers have confronted for years or decades or centuries really. Oftentimes we have advances in practical engineering which are not yet theoretically uh, well-founded. So people in Europe were building these cathedrals in 1400 and 1300 without the benefit of Galileo and Newton. 
right? And once in a while they did fall. It's actually not true that they always succeeded, but they could build them. Uh, the other example, which is more current, is steam engines versus uh, the science of thermodynamics. Thermodynamics came after steam engines were actually being used in practice. So I think of this as somewhat similar. Sometimes theory is ahead of practice, and sometimes theory is behind practice. And what we have got right now in the advent of neural networks and deep learning is that practice is running way ahead of theory. Uh, but it is still desirable to develop that theory, and it will come along. But I, as a practitioner, don't want to stop practice until I have theory, because I want to do all these cool things. So in the meanwhile, I'm going to have tests which are experimental in nature, a bit similar to what doctors do. So in medicine, they don't understand their system well. What do they do? They do these controlled trials. There'll be a set of patients who get a drug and a different uh, and a similar set of patients who doesn't get a drug, and if you see that the drug does well, we give it to more people, even though we don't necessarily theoretically understand the mechanism of how the drug functions. So I am advocating that kind of an experimental approach for now, while in parallel people pursue uh, developing the theory. Yeah, over there. Uh, thank you, Professor, for the wonderful talk. So I had a question regarding the, the policy, the reinforcement learning in particular, and how you propose to transfer what it has learned in one environment to another. Because you train a policy on a particular set of problem, a particular set of environment. And if you change the environment altogether, will the same policy work in a different environment? Oh. OK, I, I, yeah, so the answer is that I don't train in just one environment. I train in many different environments, which are all in simulation. So in simulation, I have a lot of variation. So it's captured by this variable z, which is the extrinsics. I train in situations which are equivalent to walking on flat ground, situations which are equivalent to walking in sand, and so on. So it's trained in a very, very wide variety of situations. And the goal is that when you are walking in the real world, it is kind of like being in one of the situations I had seen in simulation. And I need to know which one, though. And that is through this variable z, which I estimate in the real world. That's the spirit. So, so I do need to have a lot of variety in training. If there is some set of conditions which are not encountered in training, but then I encounter them in the real world, and they are not like anything I had seen in training, then I'm in trouble. So is it just one policy, or do you, because no, you said no, you so, No, so that's why the policy has an extra argument, which is, uh, which is, which, which I called Z, and that, it's like a function, if you have a function of one variable f of x, and then I can have different functions, f of x, g of x, h of x, or I could have that same function f, but have an extra argument, f of x comma y. So that extra argument y is like making the function f, g, h, et cetera. That's what I'm doing. Yeah. We have a question from online. I'm interested in the self-supervised training strategy you mentioned. I'm wondering, is there a memory-like concept related to the self-supervised vision system? For example, after we rotate the camera, the robot will learn to walk under the new camera configuration soon, but will it forget how to walk under the previous camera configuration? And if true, how long does this take to happen? Uh, yes, it does forget, because uh, what it has got is the new set of, con the new connection between the proprioception and the vision system, and so it forgets the old one. But then what I can do is I can fix it back, and then it will recover. So it's always learning. And by the way, this is a, this, we, we did this experiment based on what has been done for humans. So humans, there's an experiment called the prism adaptation experiment. So I have my glasses, and I put a prism in front of one of my, my, eye, uh, my in my eye. So what's happening is all the rays are now bent by, say, 10 degrees. So if I try to reach an object, I'm going to miss it. But if I keep trying to reach it, in 10 minutes, I'm able to do it well. And now, if you remove the prism, I again try to reach it, and I miss it again, right? And then, but 
after a few minutes, I recover. So there are these experiments that psychologists have done. Like you can take the, your, wear a pair of glasses which invert the world. So everything is being seen upside down. It's horrible. Initially, you can't do it. But people have shown that after that, you can, in fact, learn to ride a bike. OK? So our system is very adaptive. But then if you remove those glasses, again, you are in trouble, and you have to readapt back. Uh, hello. Uh Thank you for the beautiful talk, and it's very inspiring. I have one question about the, the Z parameter that you learned, yeah. which is uh, the result of the learning, right? Of the, but as the said, I have a kind of a, do you have a correlation? It's not a physical parameter, right? Z is actually some of the states that you learn, which is affected yeah, by Yeah, it's the, not a single parameter, but it is, it, I think of it as a compression of mm. like maybe 15 parameters. I there see. are 15 parameters which capture aspects of the terrain, and those are being compressed down to, mm. say, some five, which is some kind of mixture. And uh, so this can be compared to what, in control theory, is called systems ID, systems identification. Then they would try to estimate all those 15 parameters. Here I'm saying I'm going to estimate only the smaller number, but the smaller number is good enough, and that compression I actually also learned. So do you have a model for given the physical parameter to map it to Z such that you have a distinct no, change No, we the have Z. this black box neural network. Now, I, I conjecture that it is capturing physical invariants. So I'll give an example from, say, fluid mechanics. So in fluid mechanics, we have these numbers like Reynolds number, Froude number. Like, I forgot in my fluid mechanics, but um, there must be people in the audience who remember those things. Prandtl number, right? It's these kinds of things. Well, those are dimensionless constants which capture certain ratios, and it, it, those are the important variables, and that's why we can do experiments in wind tunnels and then, and then in the real world, and the wind tunnel will be much smaller scale. And uh, so, I'm, uh, where is, so I'm conjecturing that these, uh, these parameters which I learned, they correspond to those kinds of uh, uh, dimensionless constants which are the most important for the physics of the system. I see. Uh, that's the last question I have is the uh, 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 adaptive control. I think traditionally it's not really it's not really fast, but basically you're doing the adaptive control too, right? But using yeah. the neural network yeah. compared to just model-based type of thing. Is there any kind of comparative study of the convergence that your method can? No, I have no convergence proofs. I I mean I think uh, we it's uh, I mean the, of course you know adaptive control was developed in the 1960s when the computers of 1960s and the computers of today are very different. So I can do a lot more. I mean, I have computers compared to what then, which are much faster. So that's why I can do much more now. Yeah. Hi, yeah. Uh, very wonderful talk, Professor. So I have one question regarding the parameter Z. So if you have like one policy which learns to control in diverse situations, let's say walking on the beach versus walking on a hard surface, Will there come an interference in learning Zs from different diverse conditions, and what would no, be the, the steps? Yeah, no, so the network has enough capacity that, in a sense, it has kept all those policies in the same network, and it's like an indexing thing. It's choosing which one to do based on the Z. So it's basically like a vector, and you just do some search across that vector. But yeah, I mean, it's a neural network, but I mean, I, you can think of it more metaphorically that uh, you are indexing the policy by Z, but it's actually all stored together. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. We have one online. Yes, another online question. How well do you speculate will such RL-based systems perform when adapting to dynamically changing environments? Well, uh, that is what our hope is, uh, because the, the, the environments that I showed were dynamically adapting. And the answer is you always need some time and uh, we call our approach rapid motor adaptation. And our goal is, or the systems that we I've shown are on the order of a fraction of a second, like half a second. And for the system that I'm talking about, like walking, where you will fall down, right? I, I think half a second is good enough to recover. There may be settings where half a second is not good enough. And uh, so I, I, I can't make a general guarantee that this will work. That the adapt Usually physical conditions don't change so drastically, so immediately. 
So my claim is that 0.2 second, 0.5 second is good enough. And that's what we see in our examples. Thank you very much. Uh, and I'm, you know, uh, time is up. I have to cut it here. Uh, if you have more questions, we have a more interactive panel session this afternoon. And you're welcome to come back, join the panel session. Uh, for this uh, uh, morning lecture, uh, this will, will conclude uh, the here. Thank you, Professor Marek, again for Thank this you, fantastic you. lecture. Thank you.